Hello. Hello. <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Um, welcome, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Jostowski Castle Centre for Contemporary Art. Uh, really delighted to be here in 2023. Um, so this is uh, uh, the second year of our uh, Culture Tensions debate, uh, which uh, I co-curate with my wonderful colleague, uh, Agnieszka Kolek here. Um, so thank you for coming. And uh, we uh, hope that this year is going to be equally exciting, if not more exciting than last year, with uh, a series of um, uh, very lively uh, discussions on some of the burning issues that affect uh, us in the contemporary art world um, and some of the um, political and social issues that intersect uh, within contemporary art. Um, so this debate um, is on socially engaged art. Um, Otherwise, it's known as many other names, so, uh, uh, social art, um, uh, a social practice-based art. Um, and I'm sure you'll kind of get an idea if you don't know what socially engaged art is. Um, uh, it tends to be work that really involves communities, involves people in the co-creation or the co-collaboration of uh, making work with, um, with the artist or the collective of artists. Um, it tends not to be, let's make a sculpture together. It's much more interactive and performative and uh, uh, sometimes hitting on uh, quite kind of burning political uh, and social issues. Um, so that's my potted uh, uh, definition of uh, socially engaged art. Um, and it, 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 it manifests itself in so many different contexts. Um, uh, we will hear different perspectives from our speakers and uh, I hope that um, you'll find it interesting, that it contributes to your own thinking uh, and a critical thinking on uh, socially engaged art because um, I think what we are lacking is an uncritical perspective on this movement. Um, it's, it's very well sought after by funders because they want to justify their funding, that it engages with the public, that it engages with communities, uh, and communities of interest, and we'll hear about that more uh, in, with my speakers. Um, so we are um, going to have a presentation from each of our speaker, uh, and I'll introduce them. Uh, there will be an opportunity um, to, for you, the audience, to air your thoughts and ask questions. Uh, we really want to hear what you think uh, about this subject too. Um, so, I'm going to introduce uh, my, my three speakers and um, uh, in, in order of their uh, presentation. So first, uh, as I mentioned, my wonderful colleague, Agnieszka Koleg, um, who uh, is also an artist uh, and a curator. Um, but I met Agnieszka when she was co-founder of uh, the Passion for Freedom Art Festival, which took place in London uh, up until 2015 or 20 2018. Um, and um, the Passion for Freedom Festival um, was um, uh, very much a unique uh, um, platform, really, because it supported artists who were mainly forbidden to show their work. Um, and uh, the, 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 the festival exposed the silence of, uh, uh, of many and also challenged the comfortable position of those who inhabit safe spaces. A lot of the work was by mainly a lot of women artists, women artists who, um, who you know, would pretty much uh, be um, stoned or, or, or threatened with death or actual death in countries like Afghanistan and Iran. Um, and the festival highlighted a lot of very um, um, critical artists against uh, 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 the critical of Islam, uh, particularly. And uh, actually, Agnieszka um, uh, led a discussion uh, in Copenhagen in 2015, which was subject to a terror, terrorist attack. Um, and um, there was, um, yeah, it was um, pretty horrific. Um, but Agnieszka uh, actually continued the meeting to talk about art and blasphemy uh, after the attack uh, and said that they not only want to kill us, they want to stop us talking, so we need to continue talking. So that's quite a harrowing story and uh, 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 episode in recent history. Um, second uh, of my guest panelists is Anna Berry. 
and the lovely red berry. And uh, berry on the, yes, it almost rhymes. Um, so Anna Berry is a self-taught British artist. Uh, she's best known for her grassroots interventions uh, in non-gallery uh, settings. And she has also um, uh, been commissioned uh, by numerous uh, arts organizations and agencies uh, to make uh, large-scale immersive uh, art installations. Uh, her work encompasses a, a variety of processes and ideas. Um, hard to pin down, but it involves um, non-archival materials, uh, long repetitive making, and short-lived short -lived, uh, ephemeral outcomes. Uh, her practice operates at the intersection of making, um, performance-based work, installation, and recording. Uh, her work is responsive to uh, communities, to politics, uh, and uh, uh, various kind of um, uh, locations. Uh, and it's often concerned with our experiences of reality. Uh, she's had work at the Jerwood uh, uh, the Jewel Art Fund Makers Open, uh, where she um, uh, select one of the three artists that was selected. Or four? Yeah, five or six. Um, but also in West Midlands at the Milton Keynes, um, a new town in, uh, in the UK, uh, at the Milton Keynes Gallery. Uh, she's also done work for Tate Exchange and um, South Bank Centre and Unlimited um, Festival. Uh, you were born in Glasgow, Scottish, uh, and uh, currently living in Milton Keynes. Um, and, uh, Anna is also a musician, writer, and uh, um, a photographer. Um, then our last speaker is Pierre de Lancazès. Have I pronounced your surname correctly? As good as an effort. As good as an effort. So, so uh, Pierre is a critic, curator, and researcher, and he works um, with the multiple politics uh, uh, of, of, of within the arts. Uh, for a decade, he was director of uh, the Waterside Contemporary in London. Uh, that was a gallery that pioneered social practice and art activism. He also worked on the development and implementation of cultural exchange and engagement strategies in higher education and the charity sector. He has held senior positions in publishing and financial services. So a man who works in finance as well as in contemporary art. Um, Pierre is currently a doctoral candidate at the Open, sorry, not the Open University, at Birmingham City University, where he researches interdisciplinary knowledge exchange on social and political art, uh, as well as the relationship between artists, access to non-art knowledge and skills, and the impact of their practices. He's host for the podcast, uh, which is called New Books Network, and his writing has um, appeared in Art Review, Arts of the Working Class, Third Text, and Compact, amongst others. So, without further ado, I will pass the microphone to my first speaker, Agnieszka. Thank you, Manik. Thank you for the kind introduction and all the kind words. Um, so today's topic uh, links to our last discussion on postmodernism back in November 2022. Um, I think with the steady disintegration of the fabric of society, society built around set of values, depending on the geographic locations, there would be a certain set of values and communities uh, interwoven with it. Um, there would be a certain, um, it seems that there is a need of uh, invention of the state of uh, sponsored um, support for health and social care and so on, whereas 100 years ago, 200 years ago, that would be dealt with in the smaller local communities. Um, back then, uh, being taken care of was not anonymous um, and giving support was exposing everyone that was involved in that to the reality of helping others, that it's not simple, and even with the good intentions, there might be bad results. Um, myself, I was never inclined towards socially engaged art, and maybe because my instinct as an artist and as a, as a curator was uh, telling me that it all starts with an individual, their motivation, their actions, and how happy they are with the results of those actions. Now, what I observed over the years living in Britain, because I lived there for 20 years and just returned to Poland at the end of 2021, 
uh, is that the more the society becomes fragmented, the more we turn to other forms of engagement to simulate a tight, neat community feeling. At the time when children leave their parents behind, not only in the smaller town, but moving countries and even continents away. When Western world seems to be dissolving its own foundations, creating a void which is filled by the government's handing down set of values via education system. Uh, as an example here, I see how uh, multi, uh, multicultural Britain was trying to define British values at the time when there were many terror attacks in Britain. Um, before they have never had to be defined. We are bombarded by projects sponsored by the state and the global NGOs with good intentions to improve society. I wanted to see whether together with the audience and our guests, uh, we could challenge ourselves to look at different aspects of supposedly socially engaged art and whether they could be called that if we compare it with what we are accustomed to. So I selected, um, um, like I have three groups of um, artworks that I would like to present to you. The first um, artwork is from uh, Andrea Medar and Malina Ionescu from Romania. Uh, this is the photograph that you can see now. Um, they work together since 2017. Uh, the common projects include land art interventions, environments, performances, installations, and inter-social media and digital artworks. The project I'm presenting to you is called 70 Packs, and it took place between March 24th and 25th in 2022. The artists themselves, they say, 70 Packs is a project about community, a term that can be potentially overused due to the current shifts in social dynamics, dissolving social structures and the subsequent pleas for their preservation. The project is part of an extended research on what defines and ties a community, a community together, various landmarks, places and practices at the crossroad between tradition and transformation. 70 Packs observes one of the rituals that bring people together, the most inclusive one with a strong social component, open to strangers or to the ones in need. And also, especially in a way, it extends the idea of community towards a different plane of existence. The project is also a commentary on the present moment, on a tradition undergoing major changes. The common meal turns into impersonal pre-packed foods. And here, um, the artists um, were preparing this project and planning it at the time um, when the pandemic was drawing to its close, but there were still restrictions. And when it was realized, actually, um, the restrictions were lifted due to the breakout of the war in Ukraine. Um, the artists initially tried to get financing from several institutions in Gorge County, the region where the project took place, but they didn't get financing from there. The project was financed by the Department for Culture of the City Hall, Department for Culture in Bucharest. They prepared 70 packs with cans, sweets, beverages, fruit, and so. Um, they also had 70 hot meals. Some community members received only the hot meals, some both, some of the packs were distributed later. In general, they say that they think it was shared with, shared with over 100 people. Um, most of the pandemic restrictions were lifted as soon as the war started, so there were uh, no more restrictions whatsoever. However, nobody went back to just eating together yet. And both hot meals and packs were taken home by the people. Nobody sat down to share the food. I just moved the slide. So this is how it looks from above. Um, and the artists were saying that usually the meals are shared on various occasions like holidays, special days like celebrations or local events or charity events. And due to the pandemic, all such events were either canceled or changed and communities stopped eating together or gathering. So everything became depersonalized. But with the war, communities had to open up again. And there was a strange moment, the tension between forgetting the, to share and having to share that's, that was what the project was about. The shared meal that becomes a pre-packed box to be eaten later. Now, why this work struck me uh, was that what is the role of the state in creating messaging that 
at first dissolved the natural feel of the community during national lockdowns in various countries around the world, like in Britain, Poland, France, and so on. In Britain, the messaging was quite, let's say, it was frightening people to death. It was creating situations where people were dying out of loneliness. Um, there was um, no public debate about the cost um, uh, benefit of lockdowns, prolonged lockdowns, not only the first one, but up to the third one. Now, interestingly, in the last week, we got uh, proof that British government was spying on its citizens, among them politicians challenging lockdowns and demanding public consultation. And now we see the cost coming down on public health, on education of the children and economy. So now I find it quite curious how the state finds it useful to sponsor a socially engaged work at the time when the narrative has to change. The war has started and we have a new reality to deal with. So now it poses a question how much of the decisions during pandemic were political and how much they were based around protecting public health. Now, is art being used here, or are artists using art to smuggle in humanity into reality influenced by the inhumane conditions imposed by the government's actions? Okay. Can I have just a few minutes of the video from the YouTube showing the 70 packs uh, uh, intervention, please? A short uh, advertisement break. That's not the video from YouTube. Sorry. That's not the video from YouTube. Okay, let's keep it. Uh, let's keep it then, if it's uh, hard to find. So uh, now I wanted to move on to the second work. If we just have the beginning of the video without playing it, please. Uh, the video from Kubra Academy. Uh, Kubra Academy is an Afghan artist who lives as a refugee in France since 2015. Uh, we have presented her work at the 7th Passion for Freedom London Art Festival in 2015. Um, Kubra. Uh, is an Afghan perform uh, feminist performer and a visual artist. Now she's based in Paris. At the time when we showed her work, uh, she just um, was applying for uh, political asylum in France. Um, through her work, she explores her life as a refugee and as a woman. She studied fine arts at Kabul University before attending Beacon House National University in Lahore, Pakistan. In Lahore, she began to create public performance, a practice she continued upon her return to Kabul, where her work actively responded to a male-dominated society by extreme patriarchal politics. Dominated uh, society by extreme patriarchal politics. After performing her piece known as Armo in 2015, Kademi was forced to flee her home country and arrived in Paris. She continues her performance work in Europe, uh, and uh, she also developed practice in drawing and painting, and she's represented by the Eric Moucher Gallery. In 2022, she designed the poster for Avignon Festival and presented a solo exhibition and the collection Lambert. Now, uh, please, if you could play the video. Thank <laughs> you. 
فیسبوک ده همونجی که هر کسی که اعلامیه شده ده بود The challenge is women have in public spaces. I mean, basically, women should not exist in my country in public spaces. I would like to denounce how, um, how it looks like. I think these are the realities who are pinching me and um, which are disturbing, but worthy enough to talk about things that we don't have to talk. <laughs> Because I face sexual harassment every day in my life, every day. And that's something that we don't talk about it. We don't uh, even become out, you're 10 times touched in the street, you've been 10 times harassed and you come out, you don't, I mean, I, I was not able to talk about it. Men of my country do that, every, I mean, in all ages, from children to the old men, they're all, they're raping and they are, um, even in the family, the girl, little girls are being raped by father, brother, but we don't talk about this tragedy. And um, I think we, we become not the victim, but we become the reason for this circle of violence. So how could I not wear an armor? I mean, I would like ask this question. Many, everybody is asking me, why you have wore an armor? Why shouldn't I have wore an armor? I think every girl needs armor. I mean, in this situation. I could not live in, the, in my country afterwards, after performing armor, like I was, uh, I had uh, months of death and uh, not just from one person or two person, from almost everybody, I end up in France. But what I am like um, here also, fight never ends. I am refugee. I am, um, I am a woman refugee, and um, there's a lot of things to deal here. It's a big world.
So the fact that Kubra is alive is a miracle. Uh, the same year she did this intervention in the streets of Kabul, Farkunda Malkizada was lynched by a mob after an imam accused her of desecrating Quran. She was stoned, kicked, and then set alight. What Kubra did, trying to deal with being a woman in Afghanistan, is beyond my, our imagination of what socially engaged art could be. Now, the third part of works, um, artistic intervention, is uh, from the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, governed by an artist, Firuzev Bazrafkan, via independent information channels. Um, all of this material um, was gathered since the protests erupted after the brutal beating and subsequent death of Mahsa Amini. She was arrested by the guidance patrol for wearing an improper hijab in violation of the Islamic mandatory hijab law. All of the works you will be seeing are anonymous for the fear of imprisonment or death sentence. Um, so here I will show you some images and some um, brief videos. Um, so uh, here are the interventions on the banknotes. Uh, this is a public intervention in protest of the death penalty. Um, quite often people are being hanged from cranes and bridges, so when you go to work you can see. Uh, this is an intervention um, that changes fountains to fountains of blood, of people killed, be beaten to death, often also beaten to death in prisons. Uh, this is obviously forbidden, so the act of being in love and actually kissing someone you love in public and having your hair uncovered, it's... Uh, an offense, so they're risking their lives, just showing their affection for each other. And uh, this is one of the videos. Oh, no, that's. Let's get to the videos now, please. Ruz Bissushish Mehre Hazar Charsado Yeg Shan Shah. protests of the girls at school, so all, um, every time they feel themselves from the, from the behind, so they let their hair loose in, in the protest, and they make sure they don't show their faces uh, because of the fear of being arrested. ما به شاهزاده رضا پهلوی وکالت می دهیم پاینده ایران جاوید شا نشابور And uh, 
finally, I wanted to show Firuzek Bazravkan's work, The Flag. Uh, Firuzek is a Persian Danish artist living in hiding. After being born in Iran and having been torn from my motherland as a little girl when my parents fled from the dictatorship that overthrew the king, Shah, I feel forever tied to the fate of every Iranian woman. I was fortunate to escape oppression and male dominance when my family and I moved to Denmark, giving us a new life of immense freedom and opportunity. Yet I long for that glorious country that Iran could have been, says Bazravkan. Bazravkan works within a variety of expressions, performance, installation, photography, video, drawing, painting, and audio. Her artworks orbit around fundamental themes such as religion, sex, freedom of speech, and equality within religious communities. Her art is repeatedly about making the spectator question their own beliefs. Thus, uh, the reaction is as important as the art object itself, she says. I wanted to thank um, Firuzev Bazravkan for her fearless work and bringing to our attention the works and actions of fearless artists living in the Islamic Republic of Iran. They are all risking their and their families' lives. Only last week, three men were charged for attempting to assassinate Masih Ali Nejad, an Iranian-American journalist and human rights advocate. I hope the examples I have shown would add a different angle to our discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Agnieszka. That was really a uh, powerful work, and it just gives us a sort of context of that. Maybe what we know about socially engaged arts has a very different kind of relationship in certain other spaces where social space and public space is so highly um, charged um, in terms of um, uh, police control, theocratic control. Um, so we'll talk a bit more about that uh, after um, uh, our second um, second. Uh, panelists, which is Anna Berry. So go for it, Anna. Is, is, this, is this okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm going to kind of be looking down at my notes. Um, I haven't quite got enough hands for all of this. Um, I, I, I need prehensile tools, basically. <laughs> Anyway, um, hi, hi guys. Uh, many thanks to Manik, Agnieszka, and Yushinovsky for asking me to be here and speak on this topic. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Um, that was really powerful stuff, and um, I'm, I'm going to be quite pedestrian compared to that, I think. But I think it, um, it's brilliant at throwing into relief quite how banal what passes for socially engaged work in the West can be when, when people are doing such kind of real connected and powerful stuff. 
Um, so I'm not an art critic or an art historian, so I won't claim any theoretical expertise about socially engaged art. I'm going to try and relate it to my own observations of wider cultural trends and to make some personal points about how it relates to my art and to my person. Um, so the obvious observation to make at the outset is that one reason for the proliferation of socially engaged practice is simply the wider trend towards activism in art, or indeed one might argue activism at the expense of art. Uh, my own feelings about activism have changed a lot over the last few years uh, because of the rise of a kind of cultural totalitarianism. There's a script that has become all pervasive and from which you can't dissent and the script calls itself social justice. But when you look under the bonnet and kick the tires, of course, it's a full radicalism. It's quite regressive stuff draped in superficially progressive language. I find this to be sinister and quite corrupt. So I've gone from someone who was very rah-rah activist, far left type, to someone who is suspicious of the whole notion of activism. Nevertheless, if I see a situation that I can't abide, uh, I, I will act on my conscience to change it. So I'm still ultimately an activist. Um, I can't see me defaulting to a kind of randy and laissez-faire solution to the current problem of the overreach and intrusion of activism because that in itself is a sort of manifesto for sociopathy. So I'm genuinely ambivalent. For me, either way lies sociopathy at the moment. Um, well, I'm going to try and click and, <laughs> click and look. Um, so mea culpa, I am guilty of having made artwork that might be regarded as socially engaged. It's been interesting to look back upon earlier work with my now jaundiced eye and marvel at my quaint innocence. Um, to contextualize, I don't have a formal arts background. In the simplest terms, I was just someone making stuff. I'm not able to work or have a career in the conventional sense because of disability. And I make art partly vocationally, a sort of drive born of enormous frustration at being an intelligent and capable person for whom most avenues are blocked because of not quite being born in the correct human formats. So I've just been leafing few through the, a few of those early pieces to kind of give you a flavor of my origin story. Um, so I didn't immediately come to regard myself as an artist and what I was doing as art. I struggled a bit with bestowing that title upon myself and bear with me, this will intersect with the topic. Uh, I think I struggled with the idea partly because of the implied separation. You're no longer one of us as an artist. You're the person standing outside observing us. And initially I struggled with donning the mantle of outsiderness precisely because if there is one thing I am in every milieu, it is mercilessly outsider, never quite able to toe the line, no tribe to which I ever quite belong. Uh, so the embracing of the black hole that is the desire to belong was a sort of reluctant epiphany of self-acceptance and by extension, a tacit acknowledgement that what I'm engaged in is art and is in the broadest sense, a kind of social commentary. So one of the things that I think motivates socially engaged practice is a desire towards levelling, um, trying to disrupt what's seen as a power differential between the artist and those represented, as well as between artist and passive audience. Uh, they remind me a bit of early noughties tech bros. They believe they're disrupting a sort of establishment and that the outcome they've affected is a levelling of power imbalances. Now they would couch this in the language of critical theory and call it queering, where anything that is normative not only has no value, but is deemed to be actively oppressive and must be dismantled. This is what underpins a lot of the more chilling Maoist year zero type stuff we see more and more. So that sense of unease at otherness that I experienced in conceiving of myself as an artist, I think they're trying to, to deal with that. Um, Unsuccessfully, I think, and I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later. But I think if you're if you're not observing, if you are within and sort of participating in turning the wheels, then I'd argue you're not making meaningful art right now. Um, so I'm generalizing, but from within the millennial politics where nothing is safe from being forced through a political mangle, it's nothing short of their duty to be perpetually endeavoring to make visible these hidden power structures and do everything they can to undermine them. It's a belief system which has become, as many have observed, a kind of religion. It's unquestionable, all permeating and enforced with puritanical authoritarian zeal. Um, so from within that structure, socially engaged practice not only makes sense, but is a kind of imperative in order to correct an inherent ethical problem in the artist-subject relationship. 
And the point is not entirely ill-made. There's a lot of room, I think, for critical analysis in this area to unpick some of the implicit stuff and the relationships between artist, subject, and audience. And, you know, we all like reading a bit of Berger on a Sunday morning and we can feel a bit clever and like we've stepped outside the frame for a moment. But back in reality, I think they're not breaking down these barriers at all, at least not in this political moment. It's become a sort of LARPing of radicalism that serves to reinforce a hegemonic belief system. In the cold light of day, one suspects they may actually be proto-social workers making questionable art. Uh, so in my own practice, I started making things, often putting them in public space. They got bigger, my mates would help out. In those earlier days, my work was really a collective endeavor. After many years, I landed up slowly professionalizing via disability arts, uh, getting funding, getting bits of money, enabling me to do bigger things and to pay people to help. Uh, thus began my inexorable trajectory from outsider artists to not really being an insider as such yet, but at least being part of the wider art world machine in terms of having contact with infrastructures such as gallerists, curators, funding bodies, and indeed other artists. So you'll notice I've shied away from defining my terms at the outset, and that's for someone with more academic grounding than me, I think. But the sense in which I understand it is of art in which some sort of public collaboration or participation within the work itself, and the work uh, is more often than not political. So I've definitely seen a trend for people calling work that is merely political socially engaged, which makes me chuckle because uh, the kind of art world power dynamic is art that isn't at least social justice adjacent won't get traction. So you see people essentially trying to beef up their intersectional capital. So uh, this is a piece from the promo picture. Uh, it's a work in collaboration with my local homeless community called Paradise Lost. Uh, and there isn't time for me to talk about individual pieces. If, uh, if people are interested, I can kind of go into more details at the end. Um, but what's pertinent to say about this is that uh, it wasn't art as social work or art as artist as savior. Um, I had no intention of helping people nor intervening in their lives in any way. And I don't know if this is naive or even unethical. I saw them as collective participants and equal collaborators in a conceptual work about failed utopias. And interestingly, this is the kind of criticism that's often leveled at this kind of work, that one should be trying to help or intervene and that the art itself is only valid if enacted as a form of social work. From the right, this comes from a kind of pragmatic Maslow's hierarchy of needs perspective. Why are you bothering these people with frivolous art shit when they've got real problems? And from the left, it's this is only valid if it's about power differentials and raising marginalized voices and steeped in the context of art is only valid if social justice has been crowbarred onto it. And when I say social justice, again, I, I don't mean actual social justice, but this strange cuckoo of religious reification of identity. A lot of the people uh, with whom I come into contact in disability arts feel that art ought to be enacting some sort of social change, that this is primarily how art should be justifying its existence, which I find to be kind of philistine and a little anti-human and missing pretty much everything that's important and even sacred about art. A frustrating tug of war that I get stuck in is where the art world will either ignore me completely because I don't have the right pedigree or will specifically engage with me as a means to demonstrate their social justice credentials and how they're fighting the man in the gallery system, but in this hideously paternalistic way. Look how diverse we are. We work with the disabled artist. And their palpable frustration at the fact that I'm not visibly disabled, I'm not a nice decorative wheelchair user, and that I won't let them market me as their disabled artist on social media is quite funny. Um, it's a bit, you know, what good are you then? So I can find myself a stooge, essentially, in their pantomime of radical politics. And it's maddening that they don't understand this as two sides of the same coin. Perish the thought they might be interested in how good my actual work is. Um, so again, I'll, I'll touch on this piece really quickly. Um, this is called uh, Fake Plastic Trees, a Memorial to the Midsummer Oak. Um, and it kind of represents the apotheosis of my practice at that time. Um, it was unfunded, contributed to by hundreds of people, loved by the community, completely ignored by even the local art scene, totally impractical, non-archival and non-commercial. <laughs> 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 So making a piece like this about place and people, um, my 
my instinct was that it is crass to not invite people to be part of it, particularly when you're putting it in their space. So to ask people to collaborate always felt very natural to me and, and perhaps there's a real naivety to that. Um, and you can read about the work on, on my website and decide for yourself. Uh, so both of these works exemplify my fascination with attempts at utopia and their dismal outcomes. Um, I've made a lot of work about Milton Keynes, which is a new town in the UK. And I'm from a new town in Scotland called Cumbernauld that is regularly voted as being the nastiest place in the UK. <laughs> So my fascination with the current deterioration of politics on the left is because it's similar. All these people utterly convinced they're doing God's work, unaware they're actually creating dystopia. I find the psychology and the social dynamics of it both fascinating and terrifying. It takes well-intentioned people and afflicts them with a kind of mind virus that turns them into automatons who will happily enact psychopathy. The horror is not bad people doing bad things, it's good people doing bad things. I think there's always been this co-opting of true open-hearted goodness by the narcissism of sanctimony. It's kind of neo-Cromwellian. A kind of oxymoronic sine wave travels through human history where the promotion of goodness itself becomes a form of evil. I'm interested in where the expression of goodness shimmers into narcissism and then ultimately slides into authoritarianism. So I'm in good company in being obsessed by this. Um, Solzhenitsyn was concerned with the nature of evil for the same reason, something enacted by good people because of ideology. He said, to do evil, a human being must first of all believe what he's doing is good. Uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, of all tyrannies, a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. Those who torment us for our own good will torment us without end, for they do so with the approval of their own conscience. And Kissinger, the most fundamental problem of politics is not the control of wickedness, but the limitation of righteousness. Uh, Solzhenitsyn was writing about the ideologies of the 20th century, but the new power is the same but different. It's about virtue conferred either by identity or purity of your adherence to doctrine. Utopias involve segregation, the keeping out of the unfaithful and undesirable. In this version, that maps onto class, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Like all attempted utopias before, we end up in its inversion, a dystopia. Uh, I talk about this because I think there's something of the utopian thinking in much of today's socially engaged practice, and it's one of the things I've come to find quite sinister about it, and one of the, the huge inherent tensions in the own, my own socially engaged work at that time is that it's socially engaged on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's really pecking away at utopianism. Um, oops. Oh, bless you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so this is the constantly moving happiness machine and it's the last one of my pieces I'll mention. Um, it's from 2018 and it's my first properly funded piece. And it's about the individual's relationship to consumer capitalism and, and participation within that system, the tacit consent we give to our subconscious being manipulated by advertising and PR and our role as consumers. Um, and basically, I've got a video, but I don't think we can get it to work. But um, there's this sort of crank and the participants are seduced into turning this crank and all these pretty objects are kind of put in motion and it satisfies a, a kind of desire. And at the same time, they're sort of unknowingly animating a wider machine because the books from which these pretty things are made are deeply ideological texts whose ideas underpin market fundamentalism. I think this is a really interesting one because it's political and it also requires public participation. And yet it's kind of the opposite of socially engaged. Here I am playing a nasty trick on the public and I'm manipulating them to make them a, a, a sort of zombified metaphor. Um, so yeah, that was the, I'll just stick on that picture for a minute. Um, so next, I want to touch a bit on, on Baudrillard and the simulacrum of virtue. And I'm sorry if this sounds a bit abstract, but I think it's like probably the most important thing I have to say about all of this stuff, to be honest. Um, so for a long time, I've had a lot of trouble trying to put words on what I could see happening around me and why I felt such a deep sense of unease. And I would find myself droning on about Plato's cave and how there's this sort of pantomime of virtue that is seemingly unconnected to anything virtuous in the real world, merely by engaging in the pantomime as your virtuousness created. And I would babble about Marshall McLuhan and how the communication of one's ideological purity had become itself the virtue, 
we have the vapid turning of an endless hamster wheel of virtue signaling, whilst perversely many who actually make the world a better place are excommunicated as apostates. It is not the self, but the narrative of self that matters. There's a lot of thinkers who merit revisiting to help us get, make sense of all of this, um, like Christopher Lash, Mark Fisher, Solzhenitsyn, Orwell, but the most relief in pinning a language to this has been viewing it via Baudrillard for me. So to do him no justice at all, his thought was that in modernity, culture is always generating simulacra. At some point previously, originally, that simulacra represented and connected to something in the real world. But after a few iterations, they only reference other simulacra. He termed this hyperreality. And with an adaptation to add an ethical dimension to this model, I think it captures that sense of faux progressivism, where people are totally absorbed by enacting their simulacra of ethics, but an ethics which are apparently detached from anything that is good in the world, an ethics that never touches grass. The twist in this iteration is the imperative that those who do recognize the performance of virtue has superseded the actual virtue must be excommunicated. So we find ourselves in a culture in which simply recourse to reality is seen as a form of bigotry. Reality itself has been rebranded as bigotry. The term they will use is bigot, but the cry underneath that is of course really heretic. In this brave new world, what you actually are doesn't matter, but what you self-identify as is sacred and must not be questioned. There's an insidious replacing of is with identifies as. Feminism, for example, has become a Galileo versus the church scenario. And of course, you cannot have the enforced denial of reality without concomitant authoritarianism. I will make a personal comment at this point, which is that all of this has driven me quite mad. A few years ago, I started to feel as if I was an invasion of the body snatchers. The left, as I understood it, was clearly gone. It was like that wasp that lays its eggs in a caterpillar and then eats it from the inside out whilst controlling its behavior. Leftist hardware was suddenly playing conservative software. And yet all around me, not only had my friends not noticed this, but seemed to be happy little caterpillars spouting wasp rhetoric. It really started to feel as if I'd been catapulted into some mass psyop and I was the lone person on whom it hadn't worked, like the premise of a horror movie. And the sense of constant gaslighting from my entire professional sector, from my entire political side of the aisle, and most painfully of all, from all of my real life friends, all but destroyed me. It made me very, very ill. So for people like me who can't play the game, who can't compartmentalize, who can't do bullshit, there's actually serious consequences to having to try to function within this paradigm. So in this, I live by Marcus Aurelius. The object of life is not to be on the side of the majority, but to escape finding oneself in the ranks of the insane. I never thought I'd find myself in a position where it requires courage to simply speak the truth, to have planted a flagpole for reality and hold that line, that I would be required to obstinately and belligerently stand my ground in the insistence that we are human first. Yet having said all of that, there is also a fascination for me, ringside seats spectating the inception of totalitarianism, how it is perpetuated and policed by ordinary people with the best of intentions. To have watched us arrive at this place of inversion, we have a thing called progressivism, which is deeply regressive, a thing called liberalism, which is deeply illiberal, a thing called feminism, which comprises misogyny and homophobia. We have anti-racism, which is rebranded racism a Labour Party for blue-haired vegans in North London entirely dissociated from anybody who might actually labour. And in perhaps the most hilarious meta inversion of them all, these deeply Western and bourgeois ideas disseminated imperialistically across the globe under the title of decolonization. So I think this Baudrillardian concept is really useful in explaining why the art world is at the moment a kind of narcissus, endlessly performing virtue whilst only gazing at its own reflection. Smug, sanctimonious, inward looking and almost entirely uninterested in anything as soul nourishing as art. The Turner Prize in recent years is a case in point. In 2019, performatively shared. In 2020, a bursary. In 2021, no actual art at all. The nominees were Social Justice Collective doing socially engaged practice. 
So it degenerated into cultural elites signaling their immense virtue and the championing, not of art, but of art as an incidental tool to further a belief system. It became essentially anti-art, another inversion. To briefly revisit my constantly moving happiness machine viewed in this light, it is an artist created simulacrum satirizing the ease with which humans are manipulated by coded symbols away from reality itself. I think in many ways it's the antithesis of a socially engaged work. So one of the consequences to all of this has been a desperate yearning for the authentic. I think this is part of what people are striving for in socially engaged practice, something real, something that feels to them like grassroots connection. It's not, of course, it's all pretty astroturfed. I find it quite heartbreaking. You take something like Instagram, this infernal panopticon of ego and artifice, and yet, paradoxically, these forms fetishize authenticity and the finding and expressing of the real you. It's a toxic, individualistic and neoliberal phenomenon. It is empty simulacra upon simulacra. There's a kind of neo-Cartesian dualism where the rather religious belief is that you are your avatar. The self is something created, contrived, curated, and then projected into the incorporeal public sphere. The body is merely an incidental meat suit that must be hacked into in order to be brought into line with this perfect, authentic self. I think it was Dennis Kavanagh that described this as the anarcho-capitalism of body modification on demand. And if you were to point out that chemical surgeries and medicalization is perhaps the very antithesis of living your truth, this is the worst heresy you can commit. You will not work in the art world again if you publicly suggest it. Astonishingly, the people who subscribe to this absolutely believe it to be a set of progressive values. So in the postmodern world, the gutting of content in favor of identity, all medium, no message, leaves us with a hollowness. There's an attempt to regain value with the peppering of superficially diverse identities. The irony being that what we actually have is no substantive diversity at all, but a kind of Soviet realist era of approved culture that is all more or less the same mush. Cultural output rubber stamped on the basis of the purity of the artist's behavior, their adherence to doctrine, messaging with respect to demographic groups, and most importantly, the oppression quotient of the artist's immutable identity characteristics. Everything we see is now pre-filtered through this ideological mesh, sanitized, complexity and nuance erased. So it's unsurprising that there's a yearning for the authentic to try to reach behind this, to feel the grass again. And yet what pathos, what they reach for is but a further flight from reality, off the peg new identities that come with little flags and silly hair colors. It's a trap, of course, endless striving to manipulate how others see you in seeking validation in the perception of others rather than from within the self, they consign themselves to a kind of hall of mirrors hell. The brand of att attempted authenticity that we see with socially engaged art ties in with this reification of the subjective and the denigration and disposal of the objective. The rhetoric is that it's elevating marginalized voices instead of understanding the attempt to enforce collective unreality as the narcissistic and authoritarian phenomenon that it is. It's couched in terms of honoring the lived experience of those deemed to be marginalized. In this conception, the world entirely comprises competing narratives. Those who have gotten more airtime for their narrative must be de-boosted in favor of those who've had less traction. And on the surface, that feels like a genuinely noble endeavor. However, the calculation on whether your voice has been marginalized enough to now be elevated is not based on your actual life experiences, but on two identity characteristics and very broad simplifications of demographics and history let alone that in this paradigm you can simply self-identify into oppressed characteristics to gain traction, and boy do they. The term lived experience brings me out in hives now because it is essentially used as a magic card to play where anything, whether it's true or not, must be accepted because of identitarian deference. This is not a good epistemology. Just to be clear, I want to hear from genuinely marginalized people and artists, but this needs to be unhitched from the darker goals of standpoint epistemology and the authoritarian nightmare that leads to. So a lot of socially engaged art is falling foul of this stuff and 
leaving us in these solipsistic little bubbles where it's assumed your experience is inherently unknowable and to try to understand it is in some way hateful. It is the death of art and literature and devastatingly the death of our ability to relate to each other non-tribally as humans. So along with the fetishization and corporatization of activism that I touched on at the beginning, the other big factor driving socially engaged art at the moment is the art world's relationship with its own middle classness. The cognitive dissonance of hand-wringing chagrin with the absolute determination to nevertheless retain the stranglehold of their luxury value system. They're perpetually in this uncomfortable trace, place of trying to engage the public. This word engage comes up a lot socially engaged. Galleries and museums spend millions on engagement officers. Who are they trying to engage? It's the people, the great unwashed, the working class. So there's an irony here, yet another inversion. This is a real world paradigm where their concern about power differentials is played out in actuality. And yet it's the one they're resolutely blind to. Um, this, is a this is a class of elites trying to engage people who don't share their interests, value system, or actual material privilege, by which I mean as opposed to the vapour of identitarian privilege. You only have to look at gallery walls to know they despise ordinary people. Galleries are drowning in onanistic drivel about identity and the petty concerns of those who can only have had a cosseted life. If you take Brexit, for example, there is one permitted opinion in the art world. Um, the 52% of the population who voted for it, and I say this as a Remainer, are overtly written off as deplorables. This is a class schism. Not to mention the new phenomenon of incredibly posh children successfully alienating everybody from the climate cause by throwing food over artworks whilst acting like they're in an apocalyptic death cult. So it's not surprising that despite all the money poured into engagement, their efforts don't manage to engage much beyond the yummy mummies who are basically there for the coffee shop. So much of this is designed to elevate the middle class to a kind of new clerisy. They become virtuous via an obscure system of theories and language, the rules of which they change every 20 minutes. It's literally the modern version of knowing which fork to use, only the stakes are higher for getting it wrong. Cancellation. And it's gatekeeping. It's absolutely a way of keeping the wrong people out and damning them as your moral inferiors. With socially engaged art, it strives so hard to be grassroots, and yet it's no wonder that it feels entirely astroturfed. You have this set of elites behaving like proto-social workers, paternalistically inserting themselves at every level in communities, trying to impose their hideous utopian vision and trying to pretend what they generate from that is indeed art and not a community project managed by a person who calls themselves an artist. Woke capitalism is by far my least flavor, least favorite flavor of capitalism so far. The perfect marriage of neoliberal economics with the new neoliberal intersectional left. Um, oh yeah, I'll fit sunscreen. Uh, Adam Lehrer writes really beautifully on this. He describes art school as a psyop that indoctrinates young artists into identitarian neoliberalism and by extension morally purifies the art world. This phenomenon is vampirically exsanguinating the lifeblood of creativity itself, the freedom to challenge the orthodoxies of our culture, politics, and society, the freedom to make art untethered to the ideology of the regime. Ideology branded as the politics of liberation is ultimately the politics of, at best, a slightly diversified bourgeoisie. He talks about how art school teaches people to superficially despise inequality and pretend to be communists and such, while simultaneously indoctrinating them to commodify their very identities. He's right, of course, this is a kind of anti-politics where the use of language and purity of thinking obscures any discussion about people's actual material conditions. It creates again a kind of simulacrum of a political struggle that is not a real political struggle. It doesn't change inequality. Here's a great example of art world woke washing, and I've stolen this from Helen Lewis. Uh, Guggenheim is about to open a branch in Abu Dhabi. It's a nasty dictatorship where homosexuality is punishable by death and where a huge chunk of the population is migrant workers who experience the worst possible conditions. In the US, Guggenheim is an organization that will pour over its collections to find masochistic <laughs> grievance points to highlight and it will fire someone who was completely exonerated of racism for the sake of optics. 
It will endlessly signal its virtuous adherence to identity religion, BLM hashtags and progress pride flags abound. And in the eyes of the art world and the progressive left, they are absolved. Lewis compares it to the old Catholic tradition of charge for indulgences, where you could essentially buy your way out of sin. And this is what both the corporate world and the art world is engaged in now. They do nothing material to deal with the grim reality of workers' conditions or the poisoning of the environment. But that's all okay now because they've put the 46th iteration of the Progress Pride flag in their Twitter bio. Hashtag BLM is like ethics persil. So, so socially engaged art is, I think, a foundational element of the woke washing structure in the art world. It's like truthiness. It feels like social justice and it smells like social justice. And that's good enough to pay the art world charge for indulgences. Um, so it certainly will always have the correct messaging. Um, Quentin Tarantino said recently, it's like ideology trumps art, ideology trumps good. That has an obvious a chilling effect on creativity. Kathleen Stock wrote recently about how the death of the author craze led to the first dismissal of author, first to the dismissal of author's intent, whilst retaining the right to dispose of the art on the basis of the author's character. And finally, to literature academics believing their job was to engender social transformation in society at large. Sound familiar? She also notes, pious professions of faith about identity tend to kill artistic creativity at birth. Preach. Social justice propaganda makes dead art. It's didactic, without nuance, full of moral certainty. Complexity is problematic. When art historians look back upon this collective spasm of sanctimony, I doubt it will be looked upon as a flowering of great art. It will be a cautionary tale of how bowdlerization, self-censorship and iconoclasm leads to the worst art. Outrage extinguishes the flames of the outrageous. I think Hitchens made the point that being quite an unpleasant person might even be linked to what produces great art in some. If I have to pick between an art world that's full of worthy, earnest, finger-wagging collectives and one of auteur enfants terribles, I know which one will be making better art and which will be stultifying. I mind far less than I'm supposed to that the art world is historically a rogues gallery. Art, art must be about something real. Love, death, grief, joy. It must happen to something deeper than language can describe about the human condition, something experientially understood. This does not come from the regurgitated cud of progressive capitalist dogma, which takes me back to something I said at the beginning about separation between artist and subject, and how if you're doing your actual job as an artist, you're outside that which you observe. This maps onto what some might term the woke, anti-woke divide, the valuing of the subjective at the expense of the objective, authority from identity versus enlightenment values, authoritarianism versus individual freedom. If you're jumping, beaning up and down, playing oppression Spartacus, I'm more oppressed. No, I'm more oppressed. In order to get intersectional traction, you are not doing your job as an artist. This is the unedifying spectacle into which the art world has degenerated. And bear in mind, this kind of crap effectively runs interference on identifying anyone who might be genuinely marginalized. If you're doing this, you're turning the wheels of the machine. As an artist in the postmodern era, the essential view must be from without. You need to dig underneath all those layers of dead simulacra. You need to step outside the machinery of vapid identitarian capitalism, and you need to find reality touch the fucking grass, then you can be an artist. The chauvinistic prison where we must only be interested in art that's made by someone who is like us in the most superficial of respects, where art is to be responded to via crude moralism and banal demographic reference, is a dismal place for both art and humanity. Humans reduced to solipsistic weebles, futilely self-identifying as things, then yelling past each other about our specialness while demanding endless validation. We've conditioned a generation to parse humans as simply a, con a collection of identities on which to operate oppression calculus. If we're all trapped inside identity silos, you simply cannot make art. This is the opposite of empathy. We are not permitted to think outside the self-bubble. 
This way of being interposes a horrible theoretical framework between you and your own soul, you and your human connection to others, between the self and our unhindered decency and compassion. It's so hard to put words on, but it's such a devastating betrayal of something incredibly sacred. Art is its own argument for universalism. I heard Glenn Lowry say recently, if you can't find yourself in Dostoevsky, you're not looking hard enough. All the way from 185 BC, I am human and nothing which is human is alien to me. Uh, for me, I have to figure out how to function in an art world where art is in service to the social justice cuckoo and not be cancelled. This paradigm where I'm required to leverage my disability, my anguish and my not inconsiderable trauma in order to compete to be heard is, to say the least, undignified. I think Nina Power con uh, coined the term traumocracy and this traumocracy of intersectionality, striving to be nominally more oppressed than the next person is a paradigm I shun. My work is now not socially engaged at all. I see social engagement in very different terms now. I see it very much as part of the machine, furthering the simulacra's disconnection with reality and helping to turn the wheels of woke capitalism, part of the narcissistic authoritarian dystopia. Last year, I made a piece called A Fall From Grace, which was part of the Gerwood Makers Prize, and it's currently touring. I'm proud to have had the courage to make this work, which I think is the first pushback artwork in the mainstream UK gallery. I would hazard to say it's not a coincidence. It was made by an outsider. So ultimately, I again agree with Solzhenitsyn. He came to the conclusion that the greatest antidote to evil is truth. Let your credo be this. Let the lie come into the world. Let it even triumph, but not through me. Can you tell? Okay. Right. Uh, th that was a really um, layered and very complex kind of uh, uh, presentation there. Thank you, Anna. And um, uh, we're going to move straight on to Pierre because uh, time is of the essence and we want to kind of engage you, the audience, uh, in discussion. So, Pierre. Final speaker. All right. Good evening. Are we going to see my presentation? Do I need to click something? Oh, no, that's not the beginning. Good evening. Um, thank you very much, Manik Agnieszka, for the invitation. I'm, I'm going to make a formal proposal that rather than listen to me, we just have Anna read this text again. <laughs> and, I, and I say this partly because um, there's a lot I agree in, in there, and I fear that I might bore you to tears by repeating some of the points and then honing in on quite a lot of detail and the kind of academic sense that you that you proposed. Um, it also seems to fall on me to try to come to the defense of socially engaged practice, which is really annoying because I've written a lot against it. Um, and I've been saying really horrible things about social, social, practice, social practice in public. But now let's see how it goes. Um, well, how does it go? Right, well, that, that, that doesn't answer. It doesn't work. Um, I'll grow some arms. So first, let me tell you a couple of things that I'm not going to do. I'm not going to try to critique social practice for its inefficacy. Um, if you want to know about that, there's a lot of literature available that all agrees that social practice is not a practical solution. You will see just some titles of academic articles, a brand new book. The word failure, the word, it, does, you know, it doesn't work. We all know that. Um, I'm also not going to try to critique social practice on aesthetic grounds, although it, I might conclude that this is the only critique that really matters. I refer everyone to Claire Bishop's 2008. Um, but we'll get to that maybe in the end. This is, this is how it works. We, we lose our place instantly. What I'm going to try to do is to get very boring and very precise with terminology of social and political art so that we aren't distracted too much by too many questions at the same time. I'll try to use this to help us think about the meaning of the social. I'll talk about gardening, because why not? And I'll also try to think about why this is potentially damaging for communities, not gardening, I mean social practice. Um, then I'll try to make a case that social practice is fundamentally a neoliberal construct. And finally, I try to defend it, because, you know, why not, um, by seeing that there are communities who do benefit from social practice interventions. Most of this will come from a UK perspective, but I think uh, it will be super interesting to have a conversation about what happens in Poland and some of the histories. So, 
Anna has already mentioned the confusion between engaged and political art practices that has been, in uh, has been developing for the last couple of decades. Like a good Wikipedia article, I'll start with disambiguation. First, there are two ideas that I do not want us to talk about. One is the whole genre of political, oh my God, I went really crazy with, with PowerPoint. I, I forgot I did that. I must, must have been late at night. So, anyhow, I'm not going to be talking about the exciting world of political art, uh, by which I mean uh, the kind of practice that consists of museum objects which have political intent or political um, meanings, manifestations. So, examples include Picasso's Guernica, kind of classic, or Joanna Rykowska's poems, which have been thought about in, in the, those kind of terms. Um, I'm not going to be talking about art activism, um, which I did have written down, but let's, let's figure out what art activism is without my notes. Art activism is uh, the practice of artists using artistic added props and staging performances, interventions, usually in the public realm, um, to bring about political change. And my prime example is Pussy Riot. So I'm not going to be talking about either of those, and I think it's important to to not to get too confused, even though I also know that in the, in the Polish word for social practice is actually engaged practice, which means something else. What I will talk about, without a picture, social practice. So social practice is um, also known as socially engaged art. Uh, it involves artists acting as social workers, so the kind of people who do child protection services, housing services, these kind of state interventions traditionally. Um, they might be organizing communities, building capacity, doing schools outreach, or maybe doing community arts projects, and that kind of comes with a question mark as well. Um, no? Sorry. So I went through this exercise, stripping away the various terms to avoid the trap of trying to decide whether art should be political. Instead, I want to quiz the meaning of the social in social art practice. So, what is the social? Like many fundamental concepts, I expect that we may struggle to agree on a definition. We have terms like social media, socialism, antisocial behavior, social contracts, and social security. The social means something different in each, but every time it describes a system of relations between individuals or groups. It is not immediately clear how these groups or individuals relate. It is not obvious that the relationships or are prescriptive or descriptive based on innate human characteristics or environmentally determined? Are these social relationships even voluntary or somehow imposed on individuals? Essentially, all of sociological theory is an argument about which of these approaches to take, so I'm not going to try to reinvent these, but I want to use these kind of fundamental questions to ask the next relevant one. What would the social be in art? Ask a hundred artists and you get a hundred different answers, as we, I think, have already seen from our early conversations. But I think that in contrast to how sociology considers the social, the art world actually has a set of favor favorites. To think about this, I'll go back to social practices origin myth. When the curator Nicola Bourriot wrote his manifesto for relational aesthetics all the way back in 1998, he was rather open and imprecise about the social. Social practice in his uh, words, would be a set of artistic practices that take as the theoretical and practical point of departure the whole of human relations and the social context, rather than an independent or private space. I have multiple page fours. Every, every, no, every page is page four, and this is going to be great. So, Bourreau, the suggestion for Bourreau is that art would be that the social practice would be new because earlier art somehow wasn't con concerned with the context of human relations. This is an old theoretical trick. We can, we can forgive him that. He didn't really invent anything new, but he was trying to be clever. Um, the last few words of his definition, which is still on the screen, however, I think are quite important. Bourriot proposed that art must break out of the independent and private space. This isn't an innocent suggestion. Under this model, art would be something created in the social rather than experience in the private sphere. This would perhaps be fine, except that I think the inevitable consequence of this proposal is the forcible invasion of independent and private spaces by art. Because if we want art that concerns itself practically with the whole of human relations, this enormous task, 
as Bourdieu proposed, then the only way to do this is to have art reduce the social to something that it already understands, to make the problem manageable. So I'm, having quite, I'm hanging quite a lot on this one quotation, but just to summarize it again, when Bourdieu propose, proposes, what he proposes is that for art to become engaged with social relations, it must become inserted into the social and become the social. This was proposed many times before, for example, in Joseph Boy's idea of social sculptures. But the late 1990s gave art the opportunity to try this idea at an unprecedented scale. Uh, where are we going to find page five? Right, <clears throat> I will suggest some examples to back this proposal in a moment. I'll also try to come back to some of the questions concerning the meaning of the social um, to see if social art practice has um, remain truly agnostic in that kind of, you know, imposed versus innate uh, question that I, that I posed earlier. But first, let's look at some socially engaged arts. Um, I have a small vegetable patch close to my home in East London. This is not a, um, so this is not an allotment. It's not a private garden, but a garden designed to bring people together as a community. It's, we call it a community garden, so the, the word, the social, social terminology is there from the start. There's about 40 of us, most of, of the people involved are Kurdish or Bangladeshi backgrounds, and they all live nearby. It's all very sweet, sometimes it's even quite beautiful. Um, nothing about this should be unusual, um, granted gardening and kind of allotment culture is maybe not as developed in the UK as it is in Poland, but you know, it's, it's all very sweet. Um, and we should have more of it. Um, the only thing that is surprising about the garden is that it's technically an art project. A few years ago, the local housing association applied for a grant from local government, some funding from the Arts Council, and then they asked a couple of artists to come and create a garden. The artists were complete strangers to the community, but they were paid to spend many hours in the neighborhood. They got to meet everyone who they wanted to meet, and so on and so on. They did succeed. Um, they did succeed in getting the difficult, um, sorry, in getting the different cultural groups to talk and cooperate. They paid an architect friend to design the shed. The community built it all. It worked pretty well. And we have a nice place to grow vegetables in now. The artists also made a film which was shown in a reputable public art gallery. So far, so good, I guess. Um, not, I'm clicking. So what's the problem? Is there anything wrong? Surely this should be a win-win. The community gets a garden, the artists get a film, and I get to do weeding and composting and idle. The problem, and you can see this a mile off already, the problem is that the community itself was entrusted with the creation of this garden. The housing association didn't talk to community leaders or um, and didn't invite the community directly to get involved in this project. They didn't talk to a local church or the scout group. They asked artists, professional artists. There are consequences to this. The artists left the garden many years ago because the contract had finished. They made the film, that's also done. But this spectre remains, and even I feel it, even though I wasn't there at the beginning of the project, I came to this much, late, much later. I just, um... Anyhow, I'll give you an example of this spectre. Many of the members of the garden don't speak English very well because we're in this kind of mixed neighborhood and by virtue of gardening, it's mostly people's grandparents, like first, first generation migrants who get involved. Um, but most of, the, most of them know, because I hang around, they know that I work within the arts. Whenever there's a problem or a decision to be made, as in any, any group of people you do, I somehow am asked for my opinion as though it mattered more than everyone else's. I have more power in the garden than many others, even though the, the others may be more senior, more invested, or just more passionate about an idea that, than me. They may also hold the majority view, so like if we're trying to be democratic, then I might not be on the winning side. But my opinion matters in a kind of special way. Why? Well, maybe because I'm, it's because I'm white. That's a reasonable interpretation in those kind of communities, those kind of interaction. But I also think it's because my neighbors in the garden know that I work in the arts. Pan artista, to make one joke in Polish, is in charge. Yeah? Um, so let's return to the concept of the social. 
There are many competing theoretical frames in sociology, um, but there are two key approaches that we can consider in thinking about this garden situation. One is a model ch championed by the sociologist Nicholas Luhmann, who proposed that different social spheres are aligned horizontally and that they interact through what he calls communication. Communication, of course, is because we need to make everything complicated. Communication isn't just speaking, it's a whole set system of interactions. But a competing view was proposed by Pierre Bourdieu, another sociologist, who thought that fields of activity were organized vertically and hierarchically, and that the relationships were mediated through power rather than communication. I'm simplifying this horrifically, but the difference should be quite obvious. One theory proposes that some type of that proposes some type of equality in exchange, the other notices power relationships. It is interesting to note that both Luhmann and Bourdieu wrote extensively on the art world and its relationships with the world outside. This is my tribute to sociology. Um, so I think when we think about this kind of basic verticality and horizontality, other way around. Um, it's almost immediately apparent that some of the principles of social practice rely on both these theories of, so of the social being true at the same time. The social practitioner should engage in acts of communication, this kind of level, with, within, the, within, within individuals and the community in which they work, but they should also retain the ability to navigate hierarchical structures in relation to funders and external authorities. This isn't easy. And artists aren't necessarily trained for it. What happened? So my question is, what happens when these frameworks compete? All right. Well, I think this is what happens. Um, I'll make a bold claim. When this goes wrong, social practice quite simply disempowers communities. Um, there's a set of imbalances inherent to social practice. I already implied that communities can be coerced into cooperation, whether they want it or not. It's not necessarily condemning the underlying motive of this coercion, because I admit that I love the garden. I'm happy that there were artists who could help build it, and that there was money to pay for it to come about. But I do note that there are side effects. When these side effects are multiplied by many thousands of times in thousands of social practice projects, the problems become too difficult to ignore. The side effects of, this, of social practice are twofold. There are material effects and social effects. And I want to nod briefly at the material dimension because this is often overlooked as though it was kind of trivial. You know, there's no money, so we mustn't talk about who actually gets it. I already described the way in which the artists involved in the creation of my community garden had, to co had control of the budget and how they got paid to make the film. There are far more egregious examples. The Viennese collective Wochenklausel, who have been active since the early 1990s, have made a career of traveling the world to fix the problems in communities in places like Glasgow, Eindhoven, or Chicago, um, amongst many, many others. By fixing problems, I mean that they get paid by art organizations and local governments in those places to come, stay in hotels, eat in restaurants, come up with ideas for projects, talk to communities, then spend the organizations and state's money on making it look like the problems are getting fixed. For example, in one of the recent projects in Holon in uh, Israel, the project was to decide which residents of an impoverished neighborhood would get their apartments renovated. This project addressed a tiny, insignificant fraction of the actual material issue. Here, Wochen Klausu are essentially friendly looking bureaucrats who cover up for the failings of the state or the market failure um, while profiting from the performance and also exacerbating the failure. This is an extreme example, but many thousands of social practice projects behave in exactly the same way. This material redistribution doesn't have to be malevolent or even conscious. It's possible that everyone involved in this project is happy with the outcomes. It's also true that in some circumstances, there is more money in the art budget than there may be in the housing repair budget. But it was expensive for my garden to employ an architect to build a shed. We didn't need to pay for a film. Here, artists took money away from people who just wanted to do some gardening. There should be a serious consideration because when these relationships go wrong, they give rise to class antagonism. And I'm more concerned, I think, with the kind of class effects rather than the actual money because the sums, to be fair, are minuscule. You know, it's like nobody gets paid. 
Um, the other side effect of, the social of social practice is the redistribution of the social. By this, I mean an undermining of the infrastructure which produce and maintain social relationships. Just like artists took over materials, material means, they are compelled to take over the means of social reproduction. Of course, one of the aims of social practice is to build social ties and to engender understanding, unity, and cooperation in communities. Sometimes this works and works beautifully because art can do this kind of thing. It can bring people together. I'm not denying that at all. Um, page 10, page 10 again. Um, but there's an unconscious way in which artists are compelled to extract social capital. This book, um, Tan from Bourdieu, for, for sort of this identification of, of value in just purely social relationships. So there's an unconscious way in which artists are incentivized to extract social capital from the separate communities. I already gave you an example of this happening in the garden. Nobody wanted um, anyone in the garden to think that artists were more important than non-artists, but this is just one of the outcomes of the project. This is a reality. What does this mean for the confidence of the community in solving their own problems? So I'm essentially asking whether this, this ideal of like, we'll help you build a garden, so the next time you want to do something, you'll know how to do it. Is that in fact happening? Will this community be able to come together again? Will they, or will they need an artist to come back and tell them what to do next? Art has the ability to capture the meaning of the social, and when it does, it is compelled to rewrite it according to its own aims. And that, it's, that, isn't, and that isn't surprising, because this kind of capture of social relations is an almost unavoidable feature of class antagonism. Now, local controversy. Um, it's also worth noting that this process isn't entirely satisfactory for artists either. The reality is that social practice is badly paid and its status in the art world is very low. So, you know, when it comes to my little three, three, three arrows of politics activism, I think social practice is right at the bottom of, of budgets and concerns. Um, many social practice projects are initiated by artists directly and are run with our institutions, with our experience and even with our budgets. Sometimes an experienced and underpaid artist are placed in positions of responsibility for the well-being of others long after the contracts are finished. Um, and this is partly the complaint of Kuba Shredder's book. This is something maybe maybe familiar to, to a local audience. I spoke to Kuba. If you go to my website, you find a rather fiery interview with, with him. But I'll, I'll try to make it clear in a moment why, why I think it's interesting to think about what happens to the artist. So I think the artist class reaction to, find, to finding themselves in this precarious position is to build an argument for which artists are also a community worthy of the kind of support that social practice is supposed to confirm on disadvantaged communities. This essentially is a way to suggest that because artists are poor, someone should come and build a garden for them. Social practice, therefore, should be helping artists as much as it helps homeless youth, working mothers, or the elderly. This is, of course, quite difficult to justify. When charitable or state funders pay for social practice, they don't really want to pay artists any more than they already do for the project management services that they render. But there's a workaround, and it is to produce false class consciousness under which artists are the real communities. Uh, we, we once imagined that artists were the kind of bohemian, maybe petty bourgeoisie, trying to charitably help those even more dispossessed than them. I think they were like, now, now that I'm reading this out, that seems to be an unrealistic model. I don't know what, what decade I'm thinking about. Um, but now we want everyone to believe that artists are the real working class. And I point to um, a newspaper called Arts of the Working Class, which isn't a newspaper promoting art that would save the working classes. It's essentially ideologically trying to claim that we are the working class. But full disclosure, I have written for them a couple of times. So. I'm not sure whether that's going to be happening again. Um, the problem with the self-help attitude is that it suffers from the same redistribution of the social as all other social practice. Social arts attempt to save artists is doomed and is just as extractive 
and it prevents vital social relationships from, fo from forming. So I do make a concession. Artists do suffer because they're trying to make themselves into the kind of victims that have artists help. It's, oh, I'm going to cry. It's really bad. Um, Oh, yeah, more, more big claims. Um, the final element of the puzzle is the ideological underpinning of social practice. Um, here is where I think that social practice is not political in a sense that we sometimes consider it. In fact, I think that social practice is not political in the sense that it is neither a left-wing or a socialist project. It is essentially neoliberal, and that transcends those categories. There is some historical evidence for this. In the UK, social practice came into being alongside the cultural and economic policies of new labor at the turn of the millennium. The labor government thought that it could solve social problems by employing artists to find innovative social solutions. This could be seen as a socialist proposition. But in reality, it came alongside the complete degradation of traditional social structures, like the church or the scouting group, or even the um, institution of the state, like social work, you know, like the child protection services. And it also was accompanied by a renewed focus on individualist solutions, which sound good until, until they don't. Now, I think it's all very easy to, to laugh at the kind of vacuousness of the turn of the millennium and how we all thought the world is going to get better. Um, but it didn't, it, did, it, didn't, it didn't stay like that. When generous arts funding disappeared after 2008, the instrumentalization of social practice only intensified. Note that one of the proposals of the succeeding successor conservative government, so after New Labour went out, um, was to foster big society. That is to try and to return to a world in which communities looked after themselves. The arts, of course, saw an opportunity in this, and they inserted themselves even more forcefully as intermediators between the state and the social. So you know, essentially, both, both political factions kind of didn't really know what they were trying to propose, and they, they let art, art institutions come in and kind of muddle it up. So conservatives and progressives supposedly have com competing visions of the socials, but both are happy to instrumentalize the arts to produce a result that satisfied neither but, sti but it completely stifles thinking about alternatives. If we take away electoral politics, so to forget the, um, the left and the right, the neoliberal endorsement of social practice is also universal. Aaron Moulton recently made an argument to this very institution that international NGOs like the Open Society Foundation have also been happy to promote models of social practice even earlier than the UK did. Um, I will also say as a provocation that the slide on the top right, um, that last year's documenta can be understood as an instrument of neoliberal propaganda designed to redistribute the social in the client societies of the global south. I'd, I'd love to argue with anyone about that later. Um, Right, social practice is thus ideologically convenient for the neoliberal order. It creates the impression that more social practice will solve the problems of social practice. In doing so, it prevents other solutions from emerging, or indeed, from re-emerging. But firstly, the basic questions of how we want to live with each other, um, which were supposed to be the foundation of social practice, are simply left behind. Now, I promise you a defense of social practice, so one slide. Um, so here's my defense. Um, it will be a little bit faint. Social practice does work in some formations. Think, for example, of the Turner Prize in 2021, which Anna has already mentioned, um, not particularly happily. Um, it was filled with collectives making claims of the socials. Most critics, including me, agreed that this had nothing to do with art, really. But the truth is that artists, like the winning Array Collective, who we see here, do succeed in building communities. It's just that it is the artist and the friends who are the community, not some remote communities whom Array were paid to go and save. And look, bear with me, like, this is not, I, I, don't, I don't think we can condemn it that easily. The goods and benefits remain internal to the practice, 
but they are nonetheless essential to the functioning of societies. So I think we should be consequential with our critique. We cannot, on the one hand, complain that neoliberalism kills communities and then that social practice can fix this problem, and then be upset when people find ways to build the forms of the social. It is maybe surprising that the state funds the building of a bar inside a museum and calls it art without blinking. But really, this is just a sign that a tradition, that, that, sorry, but really, this is just a sign that the traditional function of a pub in producing sociality has been severely undermined, and art wants to experiment with reviving it. So, if I can get myself kind of row back from this whole critique, like kudos to Array Collective, you know, whatever they did, it works for them, and nothing else maybe did. Maybe it's all capitalism's fault, but maybe there's more at play. I mentioned the church a couple of times, and this, by the way, surprised me when I was writing this. I ended up referring to the church. I'm, I'm an atheist. I don't know what I'm going on about, but you know, the church. I mentioned the church a couple of times as one of those mythical institutions that used to be at the center of social reproduction. The greatest evidence of the weakness of the failure of this institution in the past decades comes from Wochen Klausel, the Viennese collective again. The latest project in Köln, which you can, well, what it looks you can see on the right, um, was a proposal for a Protestant church to become a meeting space for civil society groups when the church was not being used for worship. The question is then, what went wrong with the church that it didn't have this idea before Wochenklausel arrived? Why, why doesn't the church know that being a meeting space is its core function? What happened to my neighborhood community? I mean, this is not just a critique of the church, but what happened to the community in my neighborhood that we couldn't have got together to build a garden? I mean, you know, it's kind of both pathetic, it's capitalism is evil, but also what the hell are we doing? So we may critique art for its opportunistic interventionism, but really, haven't we skipped a step in our analysis of the institutions responsible for reproducing social relationships? To end, I want to ask the fundamental question again. How do we conceive of the social? Do we believe that groups and individuals intellect, interact voluntarily? Is the social distributed in a horizontal or vertical plane? And we repeat the same questions over again. To help clarify the role of the social and art, I have tried to exclude ideas of the political from my consideration. I don't, however, believe that art should stay away from politics. Art history is filled with important and aesthetically powerful political work. But when it comes to social intervention, I think that the art world gets very confused about its own politics and badly misjudges the effects of its convictions. It was naive to think that art would ever solve the social problems created by neoliberalism. What is therefore to be done? My knee-jerk response is to burn all of this down. This is my favorite slogan. To strip art from its social responsibilities and to return the resources directly to the hands of communities. But this proposal is, of course, also completely unrealistic. Um, one, because the manager, professional managerial class, the artist class, won't give up the control of the social and material resources. We are seeing this happening right here in Poland. Attempts to force changes in the control of these resources and the ideologies, ideologies that underpin them are meeting with fierce opposition. I don't think it's right that the legacy art world completely disengages from the question the way it is doing now. To carry on and to just complain about this erosion of resources and you know, maybe escalating political repression or tension, I don't think this is sustainable for the legacy art world. It also further focuses the social, I'm sorry, it also serves to further confuse the social and the political. In the end, neither works. But by the same token, the other side in this local conflict, or rather, you know, slightly wider global conflict of, of the art world, it's also looking unsteady. By, these, by this, I mean that it's not clear what institutions would replace the failing social aspirations of the liberal art world. What precisely are the populist solutions to this question that would be politically and practically realizable under the conditions of a late liberal democracy? We can fantasize about, about ideas like the church, but I don't see much evidence that they are ready to take on these responsibilities. 
the populist museum equally mustn't simply produce its own version of social practice within its own indoctrination program because it will only fail its communities the same way that the liberal art world did. So my question remains, how do we arrange the social for the future? This is something that both the left and the right need to consider seriously. I don't want to completely give up on art and its ability to generate new ideas in this realm. I am, however, convinced that art's innovation comes from thinking that is primarily aesthetic, and that has been missing from social practice from the very beginning. And here I take us back all the way to Claire Bishop. Thank you. Thank you. Please round of applause for our three amazing speakers. Um, we have 15 minutes, um, and so I really want to... Uh, I have lots of questions, lots of observations, but I would like to just open it out to the audience. So are there any questions or any thoughts that you'd like to um, put forward to, um, to the panel? Hands up. Anyone? No? Okay, well, uh, do just put your hands up and interrupt us if you do want to say something. Um, uh, so thank you. I think we've got three really kind of interested, varied um, uh, positions there, very much... Uh, an interrogation of socially engaged art as um, identity, as diversity, as inclusion, what is called EDI in the UK, equality, diversity and inclusion, and how that doesn't really include that many people, to be honest, uh, if you have the wrong thing. Um, and I think uh, Piers' um, um, uh, uh, interrogation of the social aspect is really important uh, in terms of um, uh, socially engaged art. My question was then, is it art, you know, uh, or is it just social artists doing social work? Uh, and Agnieszka's position, I think, um, uh, from a non-Western, uh, from uh, uh, countries where theocracies dominate all social and public and political life, when the individuals or, or certain rethinking people are literally crushed and uh, stoned and hung and... Um, to death. So we are in sort of a very interesting territory. Um, I suppose my, my kind of uh, thoughts is um, so socially engaged art actually also excludes certain people, I think. Um, so if, um, if it's a project for refugees and asylum seekers, and uh, I certainly saw this an example of such a project in uh, the north of England, in a very, very poor area, um, um, called Middlesbrough, uh, and it pretty much um, said to the white working class, we don't like you, we don't want you, you know, and uh, uh, through for projects with, um, uh, with the artists working with asylum seekers and refugees um, to make a children's book about um, coloniality or imperialism, and um, it's the white working class, their view and their collusion within that. Um, so, uh, and there was a complaint um, from um, a woman who said that the work was racist, and it probably was racist against white people. Um, so, you know, there are, there are exclusions in, in, in these kind of projects. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, to the whole idea that, you know, let's all be nice and happy and do a garden, cook together, you know, and that's art. Um, um, it, it's not usually the case. I, I think it's okay to be, I don't think discrimination per se is necessarily a bad thing. It's okay to pick a group of people and say, I'm going to do a project with this group of people. I think where it's problematic is where it becomes a, a cog in a machine of a further doctrination of, of ideology. That's the problem with that, I think. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's it's a problem in any sense to to know your focus and know your interest. And this is this is the bizarre freedom that artists do have, and art does have, because there's absolutely no obligation that art should be delivered. Everyone has the right to an artistic experience and the the Rome Charter. There's I mean, there's a lot of these kind of human rights thinking that that suggests that artistic expression is a good idea, but there's no obligation therefore on the state on any, any, any museum, on any individual artist to go and be egalitarian. But I think what's, what's quite interesting in the way that the shape of exclusion and the shape of this kind of discretion has changed is also historical. And maybe Manik, you can talk to this because I'm, 
I'm young enough to romanticize what used to be called uh, the community arts movement in the UK, which is essentially what came before social practice, as um, mostly untrained, you know, like maybe people who went to art school, but you know, the numbers were tiny. We're talking about the 70s. This is not this is not like the professional art, international art world that it is now. And the artistic forms that that community arts engage with were essentially, you know, poetry writing workshops, watercoloring, scrapbooking, the kind of stuff that the art world now only accepts if it has a funder's approval and is instrumentalized. So there was there was this kind of movement in which the the change in the class relations, the fact that the the, the, the art school essentially had to push out all these non-professional artists, meant that the exclusion had to become justified on terms other than just simply I, I want to do it and I think perversely we we're going to see kind of total collapse like when I was trying to think about a funny ending to my presentation I was thinking like maybe we can kind of introduce arts council accelerationism where what we do is we leave these kind of social practices completely alone until as I suggested Everyone who is a beneficiary of social practice is already someone who went to art school. So it's only artists doing projects for other artists, and that's all we ever fund. And if you look at like for, you know, at funding strategy changes over the years in Arts Council England, it is slowly going into that direction. I don't think that's what they would agree, and it's not that sinister. You know, just let it be. In the end, the PMC, this kind of failing you know, managerial class, failing by, by which I mean you know, dis disempowered, you know, there's nothing wrong with these, these people or their ideas, they just don't have any power. Um, let them, let them just do community workshops for one another and we'll be back in the 1970s when I believe things were beautiful because I wasn't born. <laughs> things were quite beautiful. Aneska, any thoughts? Uh, no, I was just wondering that, yes, of course, artists can choose who they work with and so on, but then the, the funding is directed by the managerial class, and then it's not so easy to then really choose and let's say I'm going to work with this group and that group and so on, because the money goes to certain groups, is targeted. So it's got a huge influence because it says you are required to engage with so-and-so on the terms of so-and-so, and so that narrows things down. That's just a small remark. Mm. Any thoughts? I noticed a couple of uh, smiles and nods uh, in the audience uh, on some of those. I think we should turn the giggling into talking. <laughs> we need some jokes from the floor. Yes. Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Karina. I am a student of arts. And uh, thank you for all your talks. And um, by the way, this questions that you asked, it's really like something that's going in my head right now. Is it becoming to this social position that art will become only for artists and art club will become some elite clubs that no one can understand? And from the other side, how we have then to engage other artists to our community and how we have to develop art, art in the future because like it will be like in the medieval ages that if you are a farmer, your kids became a farmers, not other people became a farmers. So yeah, I think that engaging art should exist and it should be like some tutorial as for kids, what actually art is doing and what our community doing in our life. And to explain that we are not just, I'm sorry for this word, like crazy mad people who are doing their like artworks and living in their own galaxies. We should like show to people what is actually art and for what we are doing art. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, that's that's a, a really interesting um, uh, point of view. And uh, if I have time, I'll tell a little story. But the end of the discussions. But any, um, would you like to comment on what the young lady said? Yeah. I think it's very good. <laughs> well, I think the question is again of social reproduction and the kind of class consciousness. I mean, you, 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 you clearly encapsulated all these things already in your in, in your thinking. So I can't teach you anything. But I, I think that the how to how to bring people with you is what art has always been trying to do. So you need to do exactly what you're doing. Just remain conscious of the limitations of what these forms can do. 
and question your own assumptions all the time. Like, unfortunately, the, the advice, not that I'm in the business of giving advice, but the advice is the same, whatever your ideological convictions are. Deal with aesthetics, deal with the world around you. And, and I was trying to say this a little bit, you know, maybe as a provocation, kind of, you know, like, like the, the, neither the left nor the right really have an idea what happens next. I believe we could do ourselves a failure, um, favor by going back a few steps and, and think about what art looks like, like the kind of very boring, what the hell is aesthetics? Like, why is this word so, 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 so unpopular? And I don't believe that the alternatives that we at the moment know are, are all that clear, but that should be exciting. You've got, you know, I'm sort of, sort of sorry you're at art school, but also I envy you because you can you can still do it. I'll be dead by the time any of this gets better. Yeah, I think um, you know just because uh, we are running out of time, we gave lots of um, ample time to our speakers. But uh, any more um, <laughs> uh, any more questions or thoughts? We've got five more minutes. <laughs> any more? No. Okay. Um, I mean, that's a good point, you know. Uh, so you, you talked about, you, you mentioned Picasso's Guernica just in passing, you know. And uh, obviously it's a profoundly, um, uh, well, you know, um, uh, uh, hard piece of work um, about uh, uh, the, the, the destruction of, um, of a Spanish town. And, um, uh, but, you know, a quick story. Is this socially engaged art or not? And that's what I'm going to ask my uh, panel here. Uh, when that piece of work was shown at the Whitechapel Gallery in East London uh, in 1939, um, uh, the, 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 um, Picasso's Guernica, um, the local community kind of mobilized um, um, to kind of get you know, people to come and see it. So it had uh, 15,000 visitors that came to the Whitechapel to go and see the work with over two weeks. It was only there, I think, for two weeks. Um, and Picasso requested that uh, the visitors uh, must donate a pair of boots for the Spanish uh, Republicans and the International Brigade who were fighting against uh, Franco, General Franco's uh, fascist um, 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 army. Uh, that was the Spanish Civil War. So uh, on one level, a beautiful, you know, sort of profane and, and, and yet beautiful, but also a horrific piece of work generating social action from the working class. East London was extremely poor in those days, um, and, uh, and supporting uh, a, a war effort against, um, uh, against fascism. Um, so and that, there might be some repercussions or thoughts on that about the current Ukraine war, you know, and uh, how art can perhaps support the Ukrainian uh, effort against uh, Russia. Um, so that's my thoughts. I think that's, that is socially engaged art. Would you say that's socially engaged art or not? I mean, I, I can't agree to that by my own definition, but it is the kind of... Um, sorry to take... I don't want to take up too much time with these technicalities, but I, you know, I, Guernica is political art in my, in my, by my definition, for which I'm, I'm all for. I mean, art must be, by definition, an expression of an artist's beliefs. It's, it's impossible for it not to be. The social that I object to, as I think, has created all these neoliberal kind of tendencies and problems, is the social of social intervention. So, you know, if Picasso had the idea that he would come and force people to make shoes and called the shoes art, I think I would probably take. But, but, but then you, we already have, like within Guernica, we already have this whole apparatus. Like, this is not a simple project. You know, he makes the painting, of course, that has a story. But the international tour, the reason that Guernica was at the Whitechapel for only two weeks is that it was touring. And there was already a recognition by, clearly, a political apparatus, you know, embassies. The fact that he did not let it hang in whatever the national exhibition was at, at the time in Madrid. You know, like there's, there's, there's a lot of kind of infrastructure there. So yeah, if to, to be boring, political art struck art activists, but not social practice. I, I roughly agree with that. I think that brilliant art that moves people and moves people to want to do something that's like everything you want out of art, but that doesn't make it socially engaged. Um, just the fact that like real people 
engaged with it, it doesn't, doesn't kind of take it out of the, the realm of just political art to be socially engaged art because there's no instrumental, I mean, maybe the bit about the bringing shoes is a great area, um, but again, if that was a performance art project, then yes, that bit would be socially engaged, but yeah. It's a bit so I, I, I want to go back to, to be really boring to this, this question of disambiguation. When I was trying to refresh my memory um, of, of what social practice, of what engaged art means in Polish, which, which I think is something very different, I of course went through, you know, Rykowska's palms. We have this whole very strange um, phenomenon that when um, social practice, socially engaged art really hits the international art world in the mid-2000s, um, the Novolipia group work, is that Chmielewski or Hammer? I never remember them, one of them. Um, that's already like internationally, instantly picked up. And I, in translation, I was able to read, again, one of those, Chmielewski and Althammer, I always confuse. One of them wrote kind of a seminal text. So I want to, I want to ask you, Agnieszka, whether you could, you could speak about the way that social practice and engaged art have coincided in the Polish context and whether this anything even to complain about here? Like, do, do you go and spend money on social intervention? Not you individually, but maybe you do. I live too long in London to, to be able to comment on that. And as I said at the beginning of my uh, uh, presentation, that's not my uh, main field of interest in art. So I'm not the wrong person to comment on that. Do we have I'm someone an in the audience in who wants to chip in? And and uh, sadly, we are at 8.30. And the reason we have to be quite strict with the timing is that the technicians um, and the translators, um, they, they can't do over time. <laughs> thank you, technicians and translators. <laughs> so um, I just want to say thank you all for coming. Um, it's been uh, a great pleasure to see such an enthusiastic uh, audience. So thank you uh, very much. And come again. The next debate is on the 30th of March. It's going to be on... Uh, Art and Spirituality, a kind of continuation from a debate we had uh, a year ago, uh, last March, on uh, the sacred and the profane. So please uh, uh, come, come to that. Um, I would like to thank the Uyostowski for hosting uh, a second year of our Culture Tensions debate. Um, thank you, Agnieszka. And thank you, Marcel, Piotr, and Be Berta, uh, the director and deputy directors. Um, I'd like to thank Brigida for helping us all to get here smoothly and look after us. Um, uh, and careful, you know, very well co coordinated uh, 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 logistics. Um, our translators, you probably did a lot of work, so thank you so much, uh, because um, we have uh, a whole range of different dialects and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, voices here, which is exciting. Um, and uh, our wonderful technicians um, who are uh, projecting all this on YouTube Live and um, you know, managing the 60 or so uh, uh, images that we've uh, had all uh, in total here. So thank you all so much, uh, uh, everyone at the castle. Uh, you, the audience, please come again. And um, my wonderful speakers, thanks uh, for your uh, well-considered, well-thought-out presentations. <laughs> And good night. <laughs>